start the recording. <laughs> okay, let's see. I wonder if there's a way that we can see if people have logged on or not, or if we should just start and go for it. I mean, we're gonna have this recording, so might as well um, just begin um, and assume that we can share this later. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, we are really excited to be here at the US Trail Running Conference to showcase our research and also talk about the future um, and what we hope to solve with um, some of these discussions. So um, I'm gonna start off um, by introducing our panelists. Oop, where's my little sticky note? Oop, there it is, okay. Um, so first I'll introduce myself. Um, my name is Krista Tappen. I'm the founder and CEO of Dirtbag Runners. Um, I'm also a founding member, member of the Runners Equity Alliance. I'm an academic researcher, um, and I'm also an instructor of psychology um, and social media at Portland State University. Um, I'm passionate about social justice, climate activism, um, and gender rights. Um, our next panelist is Jordan Marie Brings Three White Horses Daniel, um, and she is a passionate and devoted advocate for Indian country and all people, and is a citizen of the Lower Brule Sui tribe. Um, Jordan is nationally known for her advocacy and grassroots organization um, for anti-pipeline climate justice efforts, uh, changing the name slash not your mascot and the epidemic and crisis of missing and murdered indigenous relatives and native youth initiatives. Thank you so much for joining us, Jordan. Um, Jody Sandburn is the director of prevention with the Wyoming Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault, where she leads her efforts for primary prevention and social change advocacy. Uh, she's also an ultra runner, mother, and connoisseur of type two fun. Um, and lastly, but not least, Dr. Christy Taranishi Martinez is a professor of psychology and director of the Center for Multicultural Engagement at CSU Channel Islands. Um, she specializes in positive psychology, identity, and relational development. Her research examines factors contributing to well being, including the impact of creative outlets and coping with intimate partner violence. And I'm going to share my screen so you can. Oops. Let's see. It's not letting me. There's always some technical difficulties. Let's see. I just got a new computer. So, one second, everyone, while I approve Zoom to allow me to share video. Um, Christy, just in case my computer doesn't let me do this right now, would you be able to open up um, our Canva? Let's see. Do, do, do. One moment, everyone, while I figure out why. Hmm. Well, if it's not 7.30 in the morning and having a technical difficulty, I don't know what a Thursday is. Hmm. I'm so sorry. My computer is not letting me. Um, okay, let's see. This is a good way to make yourself sweat early in the morning. Ah, thank you, Christy. <laughs> I don't know why it's not letting me, but you know, here we are. Um, so Christy, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Yay, all is well. Okay. Um, so Starting us off, um, our topic of the day is empowering the trail and ultra running community to combat sexual assault and harassment in the running community. Um, I'm the moderator um, and our panelists, we've also introduced ourselves. Um, and so a little bit of a background about the Runners Equity Alliance and this initiative. Um, so last year, some of you might've been a part of the conversations, um, they kind of were on social media and through uh, groups, but we started talking about the rate of sexual assault and harassment in the running community. Um, and I think that, you know, there's this Me Too movement, right, um, in the wider community, but within the running community, it's been a bit delayed. And um, there's been many uh, folks who have spoken out about sexual assault and harassment in the running community. And um, also a lot of folks that said, it's not a problem. Um, and so I come from an academic research background um, and I just wanted to figure out if there's something that we could do together to, to think critically about 
um, what's been happening in our community and beyond. And so we began um, doing focus group interviews and kind of getting to know the community, asking more questions. And we quickly um, created kind of an alliance um, and our current working titles, the Runners Equity Alliance. And we were looking really at gender-based violence and discrimination and especially intersectional. So looking at, at race, at age, um, at location, at all these different factors that can compound um, when we're looking at uh, what makes folks more likely to become victims um, of sexual assault and violence. And so that's kind of brought us to this point today um, where you know we have collected research um, on our community. We uh, shared a survey very widely earlier this year. Um, thanks to Runner's World who shared our survey, we were able to get quite a bit of responses, which is very exciting. And so we're gonna be sharing our findings. Um, and so our overall goals of our research was to just in general assess the prevalence of sexual assault and harassment and inequities within the running community. And you know, our overarching goals are to foster awareness of sexual assault and harassment, um, to increase communication and networking for alliances. So we can kind of figure out like, how can we all work together to solve this problem? Um, obviously creating a safe space for all runners is our top priority in this. Um, and then changing the culture of running in the racing community. There's a lot of things that we can do to improve the running community and to create a safe space. And with intention, I think we're getting closer to that, um, that point. And then lastly, developing a code of conduct for race directors and community leaders. This is really our big goal moving forward and really, really excited to begin this conversation um, and continue it today. Uh, Chrissy, if you wanna go next. Hi everybody. And um, this is such a timely presentation um, since it October is National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And it's a time to really acknowledge um, those who have been affected by um, intimate partner violence and also to give um, a voice for the victims. So it, it's a really prevalent issue also um, in athletics and outdoor sports. Um, so before we got started on our research, um, we realized it's so important to um, undergo the cycles of inquiry. So we would we wanted to explore the relevant issues that were important to the writing community and discover factors that um, impacted the community. So in order to do that, we started off by um, conducting focus groups to really understand who's been affected, what's happening in the running and race communities, and what needs to be done to create safer running environments, as Krista mentioned. Um, we consulted with experts in the field um, and created our survey, um, uh, or actually before we created our survey. Um, and we wanted to see what had already been done out in the field in the running and race community and outdoor sports, um, looking at sexual harassment and sexual assault. Um, in climbing and outdoor sports, we consulted with Safe Outside and Reliance. Um, building on that expertise, we created our survey and we obtained IRB um, approval. And then we advertised um, via social media and distributed our survey online. Um, immediately, we got a huge response, uh, much more than we expected anticipated. Um, within two weeks, we had about a thousand responses. Um, Runner's World wrote an article on the efforts we were doing and widely pu publicized um, this important effort. And um, runners around the world responded and participated in our survey. So although we initially um, wanted to just focus on the US and Canada, um, Somehow this survey, it became so much um, more prevalent and we got respondents from almost every single continent. <laughs> and so it was just amazing um, the representation that we got from our survey research. And so here's a general overview of the demographics of our respondents. Um, 
we had um, 1,504 participants. Among those um, were 1,216 women. So a, a huge um, a response from women. Um, we had about 17% men, 258 men participate in the study and 22 transgender, gender neutral, non-binary, and gender fluid. Um, so these were self-identified. Um, the ages range from 18 to 77, and the mean age was 39 years old. And here's um, the various ethnic groups. They self-identified as um, predominantly white European Americans, um, uh, Latino, Chicano, Hispanic Americans, um, AAPI, African American, Native American, and mixed ethnic um, and racial groups. So this was predominantly the demographics of those who responded to our survey. So of the 1,504 participants, um, 910 reported that they experienced sexual harassment and or assault while running. So that was about 61% of our respondents. 522 said that they did not experience sexual harassment or assault. Um, well, 72 were unsure. And that's the key um, to also explore um, what those or those who were unsure why they said they were unsure because definitions change over time. People aren't, um, Maybe over, when they're younger, they don't think cat calls or certain um, types of sexual harassment um, are, um, they might just ignore them or they might not see them as prevalent. So this was a, a group that we're interested in exploring a little bit further to see why and what types of incidents that the Ensure group had um, stated that they had experienced. So we had 1,216 women that participated in our study and 70% of the women um, reported that they experienced harassment while 25% did not, 5% were unsure and the remainder were um, no response. Oops. Skip. Sorry, I don't know what happened. Here we go. Um, and we had 258 men and 80% did not experience um, sexual harassment and our assault. 17% um, uh, reported that they did, while 3% were unsure. I'm not doing the little <laughs> presentation cues correctly. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Um, and among those who identified as non-binary, gender neutral, and, tra and transgender, there was 28 altogether. Um, 17 reported that they experienced um, sexual harassment and assault. Well, um, the remainder did not. So about 61% of those who identified as non-binary, gender neutral, and transgender experienced um, sexual harassment and or assault. Oops, Krista, I'm not sure. <laughs> I wish you were maneuvering this. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so of the 850 women um, who reported sexual harassment assault, um, we wanted to see their perceptions of safety and the change in relationship with running. Um, so when we ask them, do you feel safe in your running community? Um, of the 850 women that reported that they experienced sexual harassment and assault, 52% um, said that they felt less safe. Um, and we also asked, did it change your relationship with running? And 69% uh, did report that it changed their relationship with running and they started um, having different running habits due to their experience. 25% um, said they did not change. 4% um, said they were less inclined to run and 
2% reported they were more inclined to rent. So of the 43 men who reported sexual harassment and assault experiences, 84% um, said that they still felt safe in their communities, um, while 16% said that they did not feel safe or they were unsure. Um, when asked whether or not they would they change their relationship with running, 63% um, did not. 26% um, said that they changed um, their relationship to running or changed their running habits. 9% were less inclined to run and 2% were did not respond. And then of the 17 non-binary gender neutral transgender runners that reported sexual harassment and or assault, 71% um, reported that they felt less safe, whereas 29% said that they were unsure. And when asked if they changed their running behavior, 71% changed their running behavior, 11% reported that they were less inclined to run, and 18% did not change. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Jody. Thank you, Christy, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Krista, for the introduction. Uh, before I hop in here, just uh, continue my introduction uh, slightly. Um, just want to acknowledge that I'm joining you all today from the lands that I'm occupying, um, which are the rightful lands of the Absaloka uh, people, which uh, are also known as the Crow in the area of northern Wyoming, right next to the Bighorn Mountains. So I just want to acknowledge that um, I am a white presenting person in this space talking about issues related to um, oppression. And I, I cannot uh, rightfully do that without acknowledging all of that. So I uh, wanted to just put that out there today. So getting back to this, uh, thank you, Christy, for sharing the initial findings uh, related to demographics with the, the study. So what I'm going to do is just really briefly here, talk to you about what do we do with all of these data. What do we do <laughs> about this, you know? Because clearly our data are showing that sexual harassment and uh, sexual violence and assault are an issue that does affect our community of trail and ultra running. And so that's something that we should be concerned about. And as folks participating in this conference, you know, as race directors, as athletes, as uh, sponsors and contributors to the sport, you know, like we play a vital role in being a part of that solution to addressing that space and atmosphere that we have where runners are entering into. So as Christy mentioned early on, you know, the um, research study goals were really uh, kind of, we had six of those goals early on. And Christy went over, you know, the first part, just assessing the prevalence of assault and harassment. And, um, you know, so what are the next steps? You know, some of the other things we wanted to do were to foster awareness of, yes, this does exist. Our data tells it. Okay, cool. We're going to check that box off. But now what do we do? And so I want to share with you just a little bit more about how we can create that safe space for runners, um, how we can change the culture of running in the race community. And, you know, we have a little plug in there for if this is something that you all truly want to be a part of, um, then, you know, we have some actionable steps that you all can take, you know, as race directors, as, you know, contributing members to the community. Um, and so I'll just briefly touch on, on some of that. So the first thing that we can do that we all need to know is that we need to believe in support survivors. So as Christy mentioned, you know, the data doesn't lie. Um, it's very reflective of what we see when we look at national and international statistics of rates of sexual violence among communities. We know that women experience higher rates of sexual harassment and assault nationwide, but we also know that folks who identify as BIPOC or LGBTQ plus experience disproportionately higher rates of uh, sexual harassment uh, sexual assault and other forms of violence. So our data plus 
the larger data tells us that this is happening. It's happening in our communities. And so the first thing that we have to do is believe and support survivors when they come forward and say that they are experiencing these things. So part of what we can do is just what we're doing today. We're helping to build knowledge and skills. And once we can build knowledge and skills and we can understand that these issues do exist, then we can start to shift our attitudes about, about these things and about how we approach them when we do hear that they're happening. So if you're a race director and you hear a report of sexual violence or sexual harassment that's happening at your race or you know is something that uh, someone has experienced through participation in one of your events, you know, like we need to come forward and support these people, um, shift our attitudes about, you know, did it really happen? Did it not happen, you know? data says that most likely it is happening. Um, and so we can we can do this. Um, the other thing to think about here, you know, I have a bullet point that says reinforce the values of the community. Over the summer, I had the opportunity to share information about sexual harassment and sexual violence at some trail running camps that Active at Altitude was putting on. And as part of that, I really asked people, what are our values as a community of runners, trail runners, as, you know, people in the outdoors supporting each other to, to go out and experience these things? And, you know, the values were really great that, you know, we come to trail running for a lot of different reasons, but it's, there's a really large sense of community there where we support each other. Um, and, and that's, that's something that when we come together and believe survivors, we're also reinforcing, you know, we have these values as a community that carry over into our interactions with individuals who are survivors of sexual harassment and sexual violence. So the, the next piece of this is that you all can be agents of change. As I mentioned, you play some sort of role in the trail and ultra running community. And, you know, you're therefore viewed as leadership. Um, and leadership, you know, can take on many roles in addressing sexual harassment and sexual violence in the community. And so, you know, we have very active things that you all can do. Um, I would love to chat with many of you about, you know, what could a possible code of conduct look like if that's something that you're interested in. We know that research done by Reliance and through Safe Outside really says that when we implement policies that say that, you know, we're not going to tolerate acts of harassment or assault within our communities, we know that that, that can help to decrease rates of violence. So, you know, it can be as simple as, you know, saying we're not going to tolerate these things at our race. If we hear a report of it, then, you know, that individual will be dismissed from the race or not able to participate in any of our events in the future. Or another idea is, you know, we can have something in our waiver that people sign on to at the beginning when they sign up for a race that says that they acknowledge that acts of sexual harassment and violence won't be tolerated in the community. It's as simple as that. Um, I was telling uh, Krista earlier uh, in the year that when we have people sign up for races, oftentimes they check a little box that says that they won't be rude to volunteers at a race or aid stations. Why can't we have a little checkbox that says that, you know, they acknowledge that sexual harassment and sexual violence won't be tolerated at aid stations or among other members who are or other runners at the race. So little simple things that can have a really big impact are the types of steps that, you know, we can we can have additional conversations about um, pulling folks in as to what that would look like. Um, let's see, as we do these things. We're helping to foster a positive community, one that supports the runners, um, and we're also at the same time disrupting harmful norms that exist within the community that allow sexual harassment and violence to exist. So when we look back at our data, you know, we know that a lot of folks are experiencing sexual harassment in the form of catcalls or inappropriate touching, um, and that's that's a cultural thing. If people are doing that, it's because they think it's okay to do on the trail. Um, and, and that's a norm. And that's not okay because it's harmful to people, as you can see in our data. Um, it's disrupting people's participation in the sport. People are changing their running behaviors as a result. Um, I know I personally experienced harassment on the trails. And when I do experience that, I don't want to go run in those certain areas if I think that those individuals are going to be there again. It's happened to me in a race. There was a loop 
script course where I had to constantly pass every single loop, one individual that every single time I pass that individual on a loop, he would cat call me and comment on my body in inappropriate ways. So every single time I was coming around, I was like, oh, here comes the guy in this very identifiable shirt, but it made me really nervous. And it really made me uncomfortable when I had to go into the night with that race, because I didn't know what that guy was going to do during the night. You know, so it's things like that, that we have to think about as race directors, as people participating in the races, you know, like, how can we disrupt those kind of behaviors? You know, we can take leadership, we can be agents for change in that. And the last thing that I'm going to talk about here is that when we're doing all of these things, you know, we're creating a culture of respect. And that's really what this is rooted in. You know, when we can respect other runners, um, when we can respect ourselves, when we can <laughs> respect the land that we're on, you know, like we know that rates of violence are going to decrease. And to do that, we have to work together. It can't just be one race that says, you know, hey, we're not going to tolerate it. And we're this standalone race. Um, we all have to work together to shift community norms and to shift culture um, to get change to happen. If we as a trail and ultra running community say, hey, we're we're not going to tolerate this any longer. And as race directors, we're going to come together that establishes a code of conduct or a waiver or, you know, some sort of thing um, that's taking a big stance to changing that that culture that exists. And ultimately, you know, we know that sport can play a very positive role in society overall. And so if we're changing the culture of one sub community, it has ripple effects out into other communities that are associated with it. So just, I know that was super tip of the iceberg, just kind of planting some seeds and we can talk more uh, as we get into the panel discussion, but that's really where we're kind of coming at you all today with our, with our call to action um, from our research results. So with that, I think I'm uh, going to turn it back over to Krista. Thank you so much, Jody, um, And thank you all for being here today. Um, so we're gonna start off with our panel discussion. Um, and so we brought on Jordan today um, and we're so honored to have her with us. Um, she has done so much activism and work in the running community, um, specifically with her organization, Rising Hearts. Uh, Rising Hearts is an indigenous led grassroots group that's devoted um, to efforts across all movements, including racial, social, climate, and economic justice. Um, and I'm so excited to uh, tee us off with our discussion with Jordan. Um, and so Jordan, I'm gonna ask you a very broad question because I would love to just hear you speak about, about this topic. Um, so do you wanna share about Rising Hearts, your inspiration behind creating it and, and how all of this work um, is intersectional you know, that we're looking at and why it needs to be intersectional? Yeah, happy to, thank you so much. Um, again, I'm, I'm coming and tuning in from virtually from Occupy Tongva Lands, also known as Los Angeles, California. Um, Rising Hearts really began as an answer to a call to people needing to do more, um, really needing to stand in solidarity with our Standing Rock relatives and what was happening with the Dakota Access Pipeline back in 2016. And because I was living on Piscataway lands in Washington, DC at the time, I saw a lack of visibility of indigenous organizers and voices present and center in the DC area that were part of these organizing efforts that were being led by like 350 or Sierra Club, all of these big organizations, which granted they were, you know, doing their best to help amplify and stand in solidarity, but the inclusion of our voices and our participation um, wasn't there. So I started to, I'm kind of like a bulldog when I see like injustice happening and like the lack of inclusion and representation that um, I just started like introducing myself into those circles and just kind of asked like, what is your organizing process like? Okay, well, how come you didn't have our Piscataway uh, relatives, um, local indigenous relatives give a land acknowledgement and a blessing? How come you haven't asked DC the Standing Rock um, indigenous organization or any one of us that's here um, we have a presence and um, especially we had 
people from those lands that they were advocating for up in Standing Rock um, and in South Dakota. So um, I just really started building relationships and trying to create pathways to change that culture and making sure that we are able to communicate and talk to each other, that we are able to amplify not just Indigenous issues, but other social justice issues that we all care about um, and that we all want to have all the hours in the day to, to commit to to help advocate for. Um, and so that's how Standing Rock, I mean, that's how Rising Hearts got, you know, our, our foot on the ground was because of Standing Rock and helping to fight for climate justice and intersectional justice. And over the years, it's really transformed uh, to me being a runner for 23 years, a fourth generation runner and having participated in prayer runs and group runs and seeing how important running can be in telling a message. And so one of those really key important moments was having the Standing Rock youth run over 2000 miles from Standing Rock to Washington, DC. And that was actually my first ever organizing anything of a rally and a march or anything like that was to welcome the youth. And when I saw how important it was to have this message be seen and heard and told, especially by our next generations was just incredibly powerful and inspiring. So that's what really led to like our community grassroots efforts of you know coalition building community building um, and really trying to bring people together so that we can have new perspectives new voices um, hopefully have a culture shift and a narrative change uh, so that way we can be the ones in control of that narrative um, you know coming from our perspective so uh, that's how rising hearts really began and that's how running kind of began for me very slowly of using running as a platform for advocacy um, about the issues that you know we all care about or i care about and that's what led to the 2019 boston marathon prayer run for 26 missing and murdered indigenous women was just a culmination of emotions and and events that led to that moment of why i i chose to do that run in that way thank you so much jordan and um so after your Boston Marathon run, which I think many of us read about, and that was for some of us the first time we really learned a lot about missing and murdered indigenous women and within the running community specifically, have you seen um, any connection between those two, like with native women runners and non-binary runners um, with sexual assault and violence? Um, can you talk a little bit about the connection there and what we can do to try to um, give special care and attention to that intersectional experience? Yeah, as an indigenous woman and like our first peoples of these lands, it's very, very important to acknowledge the long history of violence that has been continuously happening to indigenous peoples. And I feel like a lot of people, when they think, they think back to textbooks of what they learned, you know, from the wars or the Trail of Tears, like these very cherry picked moments in history that the government selected for everyone else to know us by, which gave us an image, which created and perpetuated those stereotypes and really normalized, you know, racism <laughs> to a sense. Um, and this we need to understand that this violence has been happening since 1492 this has been happening in a variety of different ways not just through genocide not just through war this is happening when our relatives were stolen and forced into boarding schools and residential schools and right now we have over 6,000 indigenous children that have been unearthed from the grounds of these residential and boarding schools across canada and south dakota just in the last several months um and though that those acts of violence you know were stamped by approval from the government and from religion really um you know inflicting this harm on you know little babies um and this has also led to because of these stereotypes and these this racism it's also led to images of who we are that were created and depicted for us, not by us. So an example of that is Pocahontas. Um, her real name is Matoaka, and we like to consider her, especially those within the advocacy world of MMIW and um, domestic violence and sexual assault, is that she's our first Me Too. She's our first MMIW that we know of. And um, we need to also talk about what's coming up in a few days. Halloween's coming up. 
cultural appropriation. We'd rather we'd rather have and support cultural appreciation of indigenous cultures rather than cultural appropriation. But the one of the reasons why that's so damaging when it comes to Halloween is those Pocahontas costumes. Those Pocahontas costumes hypersexualize and fetishize Native women. And fetishization is not just an issue for indigenous women, it's an issue for black women, it's an issue for Asian women. Um, and it is a problem because when people have those certain fetish fetishes, they when those fantasies aren't enough, that's when they act on them. That's when it becomes even more dangerous. Um, and so that's also what's contributed to high rates of violence on indigenous women and even just racism, ha having to experience that. Um, and so when we're talking about running, being an indigenous woman, a woman of color, um, and a runner, we, I kind of have like three targets and like these three different tiers. And it was something that I just never really realized until college when I had my first incident of a stalker who showed up at my cross country races, who showed up at the track meets, um, who showed up at my track workouts. And it just got so bad that it escalated through the whole university system where police were involved, where the president, the provost were involved. Um, and it really redefined what safety means to me and like made me realize like I can't do these same routes anymore. I can't go running by myself anymore. And it took a couple of years for me to even be able to do that. I was always having to run with someone. Um, and it just had me reflect on these really, really like, I guess like, um, like sacred moments that I used to have for myself and then having that violated and stripped away because this person, for whatever reason, you know, took a liking to me and the things that I was doing and, and even had to be like in the same classroom as him and then had to like be forced to do my own independent study to finish my classes um, was just really scary. And it just gave me a whole new perspective of like, what it means to be a runner and what it means to be a runner and a woman and as an indigenous woman. And simultaneously at that same time, I was learning more about the epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women, learning more about what perpetuates that system, uh, what perpetuates this epidemic, learning more that it's not just an isolated incident beyond you know my own tribe and the stories that I was hearing, that it was happening everywhere. And it just had me shift everything about what I did, having to run with um, pepper spray or a hand taser, um, having to learn other ways to help prevent something bad from happening. Um, and that's also one of the things that Rising Hearts really promotes is through our Indigenous Wellness Student Movement Program. It's a virtual based program that helps you sell, uh, prioritize self care, but also pathways to learn more topics, more workshops, more um, engagement um, that's open to everybody. But one of our classes we teach is safety training. Um, Cola Ship and Tower Thompson is an indigenous woman, but this one was more focused towards like MMIW domestic violence, but she's been working with me and Runner's World and other outlets to kind of like reshape this training that it's more beneficial for everybody. And it helps you read it helps you define what safety means to you helps you create a plan of like who needs to be involved in that plan with you. I don't know if anyone listens to crime junkie but they always talk about like the if I go missing folder. Um, it's basically something similar to that of just having an action having a plan um, and having those that you care about and love involved in that plan to make sure that you are safe. So now for me, part of my plan is having to share my location with my phone. I hate running with my phone, but because of how the world is today of being a woman of color, indigenous woman and being a woman out there trying to enjoy a run on the trail or on the roads, I have to share my location with my partner or my family, if I'm whoever I'm with, um, especially if they can't go with me. Um, I have to make sure I'm running different directions each time and not running the same loop every single time because I'm sure many of us have had that experience of seeing that one car that keeps driving by and having the cat calls happen or having really close encounters um, that just make your stomach churn with how things are being said to you. Um, and that's also coming not just from men, but it's also coming from women. Like I've been objectified and violated by women on a run and mostly it was in the negative sense of like put more clothes on or commenting on my body and like body shaming you in that way um 
but this is just such a big issue within the running community and this is also really hard for people of color for marginalized communities to want to feel more included in these spaces and to want to feel more safe in these spaces because I hate to it sounds horrible but for someone who is a person of color versus you know a white person our our level of safety like decreases dramatically um you know there's just a certain kind of privilege that some certain individuals just do have and you know we don't need another Ahmad Arbery story we don't need um more of these other running stories where um you know a Muslim woman was murdered in Texas or um any of these really just heartbreaking stories that really are realities in our communities and it's not just happening within the running community it's happening everywhere within that community and that's the whole thing that we need to try and shift and change is that um, we need to talk about the privilege that exists within the running community. We need to, to talk about what does accessibility look like? How do we make it more inclusive and supportive and more safe? How can we call allies and other friends and runners in who may just be lucky or it might be depends on how they look or how they carry themselves of just not experiencing these things? How can we call them in to be more of friends and protectors rather than just being bystanders and watching someone go through this um, as you're walking by or running by um, and we need to have this be you know at the forefront of every race that's being you know implemented this has to be at the development and creation of every conversation when we're talking about okay we're bringing people together how do we make this a safe space how can we make sure that everyone leaves this trail or this race or opportunity feeling good and empowered about themselves. So that's the long history um, of missing and murdered indigenous relatives, but also just talking about my own story of safety, um, but also the things that we need to really address within this community. Thank you so much, Jordan. I really appreciate your time and your energy and your story. Um, this is exactly why we're here to kind of deep dive and figure out together as a community how we can make a change. Um, and so for those that are watching or maybe watching later, um, how can folks support Rising Hearts and the work that you're doing? Yeah, people can go to risinghearts.org. We have, like I said, our wellness program, which is open to everybody. They're virtual donation-based classes, anything from Pilates, meditation, powwow yoga, to creative allyship workshop, project management workshop, to anything you can pick it. Um, we also have our Running on Native Lands initiative where we have several partners now where we're working with race directors and coordinators to implement land acknowledgements at races. And we've successfully, successfully did it at the Toronto Marathon with the Canada Running Series. We just did it with She is Beautiful up in Santa Barbara. Um, and we've done it a few in Boston Marathon just recently. Um, and so we're really trying to help transform the running industry in terms of acknowledging the lands that we're on. Um, how can we support indigenous communities and runners coming into those spaces? How can we honor the lands? And also, how can we give back to those communities? So um, we have that. So if you're someone that's listening and like wants to participate, please reach out to Rising Hearts. We'd love to have you um, and continue this conversation. We also have our Running with Purpose Collective, where we have 30 athlete advocates all intersecting running um, or their form of movement with advocacy. So we have so many incredible runners part of our collective, um, where we're also trying to transform the running industry to think beyond just the Olympian, the fastest time or the fastest known time or fastest attempt. We're trying to have them support the work, the community, the heart work that's going into all of this advocacy. Um, and so we've worked with several brands and companies to donate product to really support the mission and have provided platforms for us to be seen and to be heard. So feel free to go to my Instagram, native in underscore LA and rising underscore heart. Um, you can see my conversations that where I personally interview every single one of them um, and to introduce them into the world. And we also have our um, No More Stolen Relatives initiative, which is now being blended with the um, our relatives that were forced and stolen into the boarding schools and residential schools because they directly intersect with the epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous relatives. Um, 
Yeah, so and we also host virtual races. We have two of them coming up, carrying our medicine, celebrating 10 year anniversary with National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. They are an indigenous led org focusing um, on ending violence in our communities. They provide um, and work with coalitions that provide safe homes and shelters. Um, a lot of MMIW, MMIR advocacy efforts. Uh, they partnered with us on the May 5th Running for Justice that we just did this past year. Um, and then we also have our Truths Giving Four Miler coming up um, to really help reframe how we think about the upcoming holiday towards the end of the, the month. Um, and yeah, I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, you can follow us on our socials or go to our website and you can contact us. We're definitely um, stretched thin, but we always still like to, to be in conversation. So that's about it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jordan. All right, we're going to move next to Jody. Um, Jody, so you do so much work on domestic violence and assault and prevention. Um, and we're so excited to have you here to kind of pick your brain and hopefully share some of those resources and knowledge with the community. Um, so can you share um, what steps that you feel like the trail running race culture can do to be more inclusive um, of diverse backgrounds, including gender, sexual orientation, um, race, ethnicity, so all of these factors, right? Social and economic status, age, um, and what are the proven methods um, that you're aware of currently that we can hopefully adopt within the running community? Yeah, huge question, but thank you, Krista. Uh, I'll, I'll try to just kind of touch the, the tip of the iceberg there. Um, so I think what's really important for us to understand, and I think Jordan so beautifully uh, kind of laid this out for us, is that, um, you know, sexual violence, sexual harassment is really rooted in oppression. Um, you know, when we get down to it, when we get down to the root causes of, you know, why does violence exist in the first place is because of oppression. And we know that oppression exists because of inequities um, and quests for, you know, like people wanting power and all this other stuff, you know, but this isn't a sociology class, so I'm not going to dive too deep into it. Uh, but really, like, what we need to do first and foremost, you know, is to understand, like, why does sexual violence happen in the first place? Like, why do people think that it's okay to sexually harass or, you know, uh, engage in acts of violence against another person? Um, you know, we... <laughs> We, we often think of like, oh, well, let's let's teach everybody how to be safe on the trails, you know, like let's teach self-defense classes, you know, and, and Jordan mentioned the safety planning and, you know, the, the, the stuff that Rising Hearts is doing, which is beautiful. But the reality is that, to be honest, it sucks that women have to do that. Like, I'm just going to put it out there as plain as I can, like, and that's light language for me. But it sucks that we have to do this, that the onus of, you know, all of that is put onto the women and the folks who, you know, are experiencing rates of harassment and, and violence, you know, that, uh, that we're not focusing on the, the perpetrator, you know, like the person who is committing these acts or who is engaging in sexual harassment, that we're not focusing on how do we change their behavior to create these safer spaces, um, you know, but that's the reality of it, you know, is that we're here. Um, so I would encourage all of us as we're thinking about how can we create safer spaces for everyone who comes to participate in trail and ultra running in these communities, whether it's, you know, they just go and run on their own or if they're participating in races, is that we first understand that, you know, this is not something that we need to like, just kind of go along and put band-aids on. Like we got to get to the root of the problem and change those inequalities that exist. Um, we have to look at things like, why don't more folks of color participate? Why don't more LGBTQ folks participate? Um, you know, like why do less women participate? You know, gender inequality is not a new issue in our sport. Um, and we have to think about why are less people, you know, who identify as women or who, people who live at margins or who have multiple identities, you know, why are they not getting here? Is it because they don't feel safe? Probably, like really. There are so many things that, that can contribute, but like safety is a huge piece of that. So if we can shift our focus to making uh, or eradicating those issues that make people feel less safe and we increase ways that we can even out 
um, you know, the playing field or create more equitable, accessible opportunities for folks who historically have not been able to participate, um, then, you know, we're going to see rates of violence decrease. So, uh, you know, like, it's a big, long way to try to answer your question, Krista. But, you know, we know that, you know, we want to, as a, as a community, we want to increase rates of female participation. We want to increase rates of BIPOC LGBTQ folks participation in our sports, but we cannot do so if we continuously have data that says that people don't feel safe for whatever reason. And so for me, that's an equity issue. And we have to focus on equity and increasing, you know, access uh, to access is a huge one, right? And participation so that folks can can actually show up to the starting line or can, you know, get out the door to go for a run, you know, or whatever that, that might be. So um, hopefully I answered your question <laughs> in a really long roundabout way. Thank you so much, Jody. And I'm really good at asking broad questions today. <laughs> Just so you can kind of, you know, go in any direction. And this is really, I want, I want the flow with this conversation, right? Um, and not to be too regimented. So thank you for that. Um, and, you know, just as we're talking about this, Jody, you and I have talked a lot about, about the running community's resistance. And this isn't a question that we have on this, but it's, as I'm thinking about this, um, specifically race directors, their resistance to wanting to adopt change within their policies. And you and I both reached out to multiple high name race organizations that pretty much all denied us um, and didn't want to participate in this panel. And that was really disheartening because I hate to say that I expected the opposite um, and was really excited about that. And, and one of our goals together is to hopefully find, you know, some race directors and community leaders more broadly that are, are willing to step up and, you know, take this, um, take this initiative and make it actualized, you know, within their onboarding, within their websites and their documents. Um, what would your message be to, I guess, to respond to this and, you know, to our, our broader community? I, do we, do we need to kind of like, I don't want to say peer pressure, but really like if we could all unanimously ask for this change, maybe they'll start to listen. Like, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for asking. Um, so I think it, based on the experiences that we've had with um, asking uh, a few races, um, you know, one of the things that I think I'm hearing from folks is that they're afraid that if they put some sort of a um, policy in place or code of conduct or something that says, you know, like we're not going to tolerate acts of sexual harassment or sexual violence, then that means that the race has to somehow be responsible for adjudicating that. You know, if someone comes forward and they're like, hey, I experienced sexual harassment, then the race is like, oh, well, now I have to prove that, they, that this happened um, to be able to kick this person out. And the reality of it is you don't. <laughs> like, we're not asking you to prove that anything happened. What we're asking you to do is to set a set of set a set of standards or establish a set of standards for your race that says that, you know, like this is the expectation for how we want you to behave here when you participate. Like I mentioned before, you tell people that they can't be rude to your aid station volunteers. So why can't you tell people that they can't sexually harass someone on the trail? The data doesn't lie here, folks. You know, the data tells us that people are experiencing harassment and violence while participating in trail running. And in no where in no way are we asking you to to prove something in a court of law you know if a survivor should come forward and say that they experienced uh, violence on your trail or you know as part of participating in an event that you have um, on the trails if they should choose to go to the police then they have that right they can do that they can go to the police and say you know i experienced this and then the police conduct an investigation it's not up to the race to conduct an investigation. It's up to the race to provide a safe 
environment that supports that person. So, you know, that can be as simple as the race director saying, you know, I'm sorry that this happened to you and I believe you and I can provide you with uh, a list of resources should you choose to do anything moving forward. You know, there's nothing out there that says that race directors are mandated reporters of sexual violence unless it happens to someone who's under the age of 18. So, you know, there's really an opportunity here for race directors to set or establish that that basic standard of like, how are we going to interact with each other when we're on the trails? And if something should happen to someone, are we in a place where we can support them and hand them a list of resources, you know, that uh, that the appropriate people can follow up with them on? So hopefully that answered the question, Krista. Very well, thank you. Uh, we're, we have five more minutes, so I'm gonna to try to squeeze in some more questions. Um, so we're gonna to move to Christy next. Um, Christy, you've spent over a decade researching intimate partner violence. Um, what are the key takeaways um, for empowering community that you've seen um, more broadly that you think could apply well to the running community? So I think, um, wow, I, it's hard to follow after all that, but, and I, I don't want to take up all the time either, um, because I did want to hear also from the community um, members that are here. I, um, it is such a prevalent issue, and as Jody said, the data doesn't lie. It's really important to acknowledge we have over 1,500 participants from across the world that is talking about this um, prevalent issue. And the thing that I really want to emphasize, mental health is such an important issue and we need to get over the stigma of talking about depression, anxiety, all of the things that happen because we've been assaulted or harassed. And um, there's so much generational trauma as Jordan um, mentioned in her stories, generation after generation, we don't understand why our grandparents were, you know, went through depression or angry all the time. And it could have been these um, things we, we, in my research, we call them dirty little secrets. We just hold all these secrets in and we don't want, we think we're protecting the next generation by not talking about it but it's not, we need to bring it out in the open and speak about this. Um, and we need to teach our next generation of children, um, you know, these, these types of things, how to respect each other, how to listen to others and hear their stories. Um, and we need to create communities where we can feel safe to speak out. Um, I think from the Me Too movement, we saw that once one person spoke out, other people had the same experiences so that we could relate to them, we can talk to them, we could acknowledge that they went through these experiences and we can try to um, put things in place where we can um, intervene and stop this racial and social injustices and um, abuse that's going on. Um, and I think there's a lot of um, organizations and communities that are, creating change or attempting to create change um, within our university. We put on events like um, Our Bodies, Our Minds through the Art with Impact organization. We allow students, faculty, staff, administrators to come together to speak out about um, things that have the, their own experiences as well as to create um, places where we can um, support others who have experienced um, intimate partner violence or assault. Um, and I think creating allies, places where we can speak out and, and be allies to others. The um, AAPI community has the bystander intervention program. Things like that can really help to um, to bring people together and create communities where you do feel safe and you can um, get support and help. Um, to, I'm gonna <laughs> pass it back to you because I know we only had a few minutes. Um, so I hope that helps a little bit, but yes, I think creating communities where we do feel safe to speak out about our experiences is really important. 
Thank you so much, Christy. And I wish we had another hour to talk about this. And um, I wish we had more time. And we have about a minute left. And we just got a question um, from Connie. Um, but I don't think, I'm so sorry, Connie. I don't think we have enough time because I believe we end in about a minute. So feel free, anyone, to reach out to us directly. We're all on social media. Um, you can learn more about us at the Runners Equity Alliance .com. Um, you can follow each of us on social media and learn more. Please reach out if you have any questions. We're continuing this conversation. This is just the beginning. Um, thank you all for listening and for being a part. Perfect. Yeah, you can see in the chat too, um, Jordan dropped her links. Um, thank you so much, everyone. I hope you all have a beautiful Thursday. Um, thank you for being a part of this. I know it's early. Um, thank you, everyone. And have a great rest of your evening or day. <laughs> it's the morning. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Wonderful. Chris, Krista. Yeah, Christy, Jordan, and Jody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and a round of applause from yeah, the audience here. Woo! Um, one thank you so much. I want to add really quickly is that when we were doing these studies um, and getting community based participatory research that's part of that we need to make sure that we're including two spirit when we're talking about the LGBT two Q and non binary uh, community. Uh, it's an identity of the indigenous peoples um, and it's one that predates settler colonialism on these lands, so um, when you are including a non binary or an X check mark um please make sure you're including a two-spirit opportunity thank you jordan and moving forward we will make sure to include that and i appreciate that feedback thank you thank you thank you jordan and uh yeah it, uh, brilliant panel krista i'm, I'm going to end the recording now and uh, um, and then end the uh, um, end the zoom but uh, but appreciate all your time thank you so much uh, uh, really important conversations and uh, i um, so glad that we were able to share this here today and uh, um, look forward to changes coming. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.